All right, I am so honored to welcome our speaker today, Dr. John DeLenn. Um, some of you may know that about a decade ago, he started a podcast called Mormon Stories Podcast. And if I understand correctly, um, originally it was to literally just give people who were part of the Mormon faith a place to share their stories, literally. Um, and it's grown to become, serve multiple needs. One that does include um, giving a voice to transitioning and post-Mormons and multiple other uh, organizations you've found in outside that have grown out of this. It's been really incredible. Um, secondary, like this year, last year, it's January now, um, he received his PhD in psychology. Um, and it was a true labor of love for him. And really exciting, last week, um, one of the places that uh, Mike Alice of Houston Oasis and I visited was his community of good in Cache Valley, which he helped to found last fall. And we, um, along with them, they decided, saw the greater um, value of being a part of a larger network, a larger family, and decided to unanimously affiliate with Oasis. So his, we are welcoming one of our own now. So may we give a really great warm welcome to someone who just became a part of our Oasis family, Dr. John DeLynn. Thank you, Helen. Uh, I have to say it was a real honor to hang out with Helen and Mike uh, for an entire weekend, touring around Utah, seeing how many people were excited to participate in what you all are, are doing here. Uh, and I, I have to say it's really humbling to be in front of this group of amazing people in Kansas City wondering what this white, straight, heterosexual, you know, white, straight, uh, privileged Mormon male could ever share with, with people like you. Um, but I do have a story, and I think, I hope you might find it a little bit interesting. Um, uh, and I just want you to know that in many ways, for years, I've been dreaming about uh, the possibility of what I'm seeing before me. So I'm really moved uh, just to be here, and I'm honored. So thank you, Helen, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, the topic that I chose today uh, is uh, how Mormonism led me out of Mormonism. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you to indulge me just a tiny bit as I kind of reflect on my, my past and my history. Uh, it's not in any way to be narcissistic, uh, but instead it's just a way for me to um, kind of tell you a bit of my story. And so uh, I just want to start by saying that in many ways I, uh, I live the Mormon dream. Uh, I'm a sixth generation Mormon. My ancestors crossed the plains, uh, in many ways beginning in, in Ohio and Illinois and Missouri, uh, traveling across the plains to settle, you know, Utah and Idaho. Um, but, but, you know, when I was a baby, I didn't know anything about that. I knew that I had this beautiful grandmother named Karma, who was a, a cousin to our 13th prophet, uh, Ezra Tap Benson of our church. Uh, I loved her. She was this sweet uh, old Mormon lady. These are my parents on the day of their marriage. They were married in the St. George Temple uh, in Utah for time and all eternity. We'll get to that in just a second. That's me as a baby, a sweet little Mormon baby. Uh, as you know, Mormons are the largest participants in the Boy Scouts, and that's me participating uh, in a decathlon as a young boy. Um, and here I am in all my uh, previous, you know, white glory representing sort of uh, my people second place, but still I was really I was really proud to, to represent uh, There's there's my family with karma and Bernice my grandparents. That's me in the bottom right This was my family around late 1970s early 1980s. That's me on the bottom left and uh, It was an amazing time went on to um, you know, star on the basketball team, and, and uh, that's me at prom with my buddy Chad. And in so many ways, I, I look at my Mormon upbringing as this beautiful, sweet experience, almost like this white fruit that was desirable above all other things. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy and proud of, of all the many virtues and values that my, that my church uh, bestowed upon me. And there are many values uh, that I picked up. Um, some of them good and some of them maybe not so good. Uh, but, but probably the thing that I was most proud of is growing up as a Mormon boy. You know, I, I played basketball, I, I had a lot of friends, I had a lot of opportunities to do a lot of crazy things. 
Um, but uh, I, you know, I was a proud Mormon boy, and so never tried alcohol, never tried tea, tobacco, coffee, no drugs, no premarital sex, no masturbation. Like, uh, you know, how many of you can say you, you know, graduated from high school having never experienced any of those things? <laughs> That was a real accomplishment. I was really proud. Um, that was 100% Mormonism. I'll tell you, that wasn't natural for me uh, at all, but I did it. How many of you are raised Mormon? Raise your hands if you're raised Mormon. All right, I'm gonna ask for your help, okay? Uh, as I think about some of the other values that, that Mormonism bestowed upon me, I can't help but think about some of the songs that I learned as a child. Um, and so I'm, we're gonna sing a few songs. So those of you who are Mormon, I'm asking you to join in with me and just sing a few songs. So the first song we're gonna sing is Give Set the Little Stream. Are you guys ready? Yeah. Will you sing it with me? Yes. Okay. Give set the little stream, give oh give, give oh give, give set the little stream as he hurried down the hill. I'm small, I know, but wherever I go, the grass grows greener still. Singing, singing all the day, give away, oh give away. Singing, singing all the day, give, oh give away. That's the first value that I learned as a Mormon. Service, right? Good job, everybody, yes. One small example of service growing up as a Mormon boy, I remember my brother and I were thinking about how we can serve our community. It was Thanksgiving. Uh, we were thinking, what can we do that's nice? We saw this homeless man. We went to this little place and we, we bought him a turkey dinner. We don't even know if he was hungry. We don't know if he liked turkey. We didn't care. We brought this man a turkey dinner on Thanksgiving and that's what Mormonism meant to me. It meant service. Um, another song that I learned as, as a young primary child was Dare to Do Right. You guys ready? Let's do it. Dare to do right, dare to be true. You have a work that no other can do. Do it so bravely, so kindly, so well. Angels will hasten the story to tell. Dare, dare, dare to do right. Dare, dare, dare to be true. Dare to be true. Dare to be true. That was my second value, courage, right? Mormons do things that are hard, right? We have that pioneer heritage. So I remember a time in fifth grade where I was worked all year to run uh, circles around this track in, in physical education so that I could go to this camp out at the end of the year. And I wasn't perfect. I was so excited for this camp out that I went and stole four pocket knives from the local drugstore, wrapped them up in my sleeping bag, was all excited to go to this camp out that I would worked all year for, and my dad said, you know what, son, your sleeping bag doesn't look quite folded quite correctly. Let me unroll it and teach you how to roll a sleeping bag upright. And he found those four pocket knives. And he looked at me and he said, where did you get these? And even though I had stolen them, I couldn't lie. I couldn't be dishonest. And I said, dad, I stole them. Uh, that was a hard thing to do because I had worked so hard to earn, you know, to, to earn that uh, camping trip. Uh, but we decided together that I just wouldn't go that year. And all my friends went on the camping trip. <laughs> and I had to stay back. And, uh, but that was okay. In some ways I felt good because I knew that I was doing the right thing because that's what Mormons do, they have courage. The last song that, uh, that I'll share with you maybe, maybe one more, it's called I'll Walk With You. And this is one of the most beautiful songs uh, that I learned as a kid. And I'll just sing a bit for you now. If you don't walk as most people do, some people walk away from you, but I won't, I won't. If you don't talk as most people do, some people talk and laugh at you, but I won't, I won't. I'll walk with you, I'll talk with you, that's how I'll show my love for you. Love and kindness was a really important part of my Mormon upbringing. Uh, oddly, this was manifested in several ways, one of which was when I was a freshman in college and noticed that there were a lot of girls who weren't asked to homecoming. And so instead of just picking my favorite girl, I asked everyone in the dormitory who had not been asked to homecoming. And here's a picture of all of us going home. Now looking back, that's a little awkward, right? It's very Mormon. <laughs> so, a little subconscious stuff going on. But these, you know, these were the 
Valleas and I learned as Mormon, and I'm very proud of them. And these were genuinely taught to me courage and service and kindness. <coughs> now, um, uh, one final value that Mormons taught, it, it, actually a doctrine, is that, um, that families can be forever, that you can live with your family in heaven in the afterlife. Um, and this was an amazing thing if you were Mormon, because unfortunately, if you're Mormon and married in the temple, you get to go with your family to heaven. Well, unfortunately, what that means is for the rest of you who weren't married in the temple as a Mormon, well, your families don't get to make it. I'm sorry about that. That must be really disappointing for you, but it was really good for us. <laughs> so I love my family, and I was really excited um, to be able to be with them forever uh, in heaven. Now, of course, I did learn a few other values as a Mormon, uh, such as that homosexuality was evil, that, that African and Native Americans were given dark skin as a curse by God because of their wickedness, um, and that God did not want women to lead the church. But, you know, those values weren't so bad because we had so many other good ones, and, and in some ways I probably agreed with, with some of those things at the time. So overall, this was an amazing Mormon dream that I was engaged in. It was fantastic, <laughs> straight tabulous, Millie, I don't need better words here, I need a speech writer. That's our core Millie 12 apostles. We've come a long way, by the way, in terms of diversity. So, um, by the way, I, over in that corner I Googled, I Googled the words dark skin curse under Google Images. And you know what the third image that came up is? The Book of Mormon. But anyway, this represents how I felt growing up. We lived the Mormon American dream, and I was super happy. <laughs> Any of you guys seen the Book of Mormon musical? Yes! I was Elder Price. Remember that point in the musical where he says, I want to be the Mormon who changes all mankind. That was it, that was me. I believed that I was sent to the earth to do great things. Unfortunately, um, in my Mormon, you know, dream, a few cracks uh, slowly developed along the way. Uh, the first crack was when my parents got divorced. Um, it's one thing to hear this beautiful primary song about families being together forever, right? And that's wonderful if your family's intact. But what happens if you're a 10-year-old, 12-year-old kid sitting in primary and you're listening to these words just after your parents got divorced? Families can be together forever through heavenly Father's plan. I always want to be with my own family, and the Lord has shown me how I can. And you're sitting there seeing all these other kids with big smiles on their face, and you're realizing that you just lost that uh, most important American dream. <clears throat> on the one hand, it makes you sad because of uh, you know, what you are losing personally. But on the other hand, it makes you think about all the many people in the world who also aren't gonna have that amazing thing. So it starts to develop in you a sense of sympathy and empathy for other people who don't fit in the mold, both inside the church and out. Uh, another crack that happened was, um, and this, you know, I'm not bitter, but uh, I, I went to high school with Renee Zellweger. Uh, she's an Academy Award winning actress. We both went to Katy High School. My junior year, uh, it's New Year's Eve, and uh, I, I uh, asked Renee to go to a church dance with me. Um, so I picked her up in the car, drove her like 45 minutes to this New Year's Eve dance. She was beautiful, fun, a great dancer. I was really excited to, to take her to this Mormon dance. I had the secret hope that she would maybe convert, you know. Um, so she shows up in this beautiful dress, and, and I had my suit on, and when we show up, uh, the, the leaders of the church look at her, and they look at me, and they say, and they point to her and say, you need to go home and change. Your shoulders are showing. Now, I'm just thinking, what? You know, but I'm like, all right, let's go. So I turn to Renee, let's go change. And she's like crying, you know? And I, we get in the car and I'm driving her home and I'm like, you, you okay? And she's just, take me home. You know? I'm like, you could have had Renee Selwiger as a Mormon. She could have been your John Travolta, you know? She could have been your Tom Cruise. What were you doing, Mormon church? We lost Renee Selwiger as a possible convert that day. But, but honestly, when I think about one of your values, people are more important than beliefs. A little crack emerged as I realized that in that instance, the belief was way more important than this person. This was our first exposure to the church. And, you know, maybe I was a little bitter that they ruined my chances of, you know, <laughs> my chances with Renee. But that was another crack that developed. 
I remember one time as a high school kid just doing the math for a second. I was like, how many Mormons are there in the world? And there's like 10 million or something at the time. And I'm like, how many people are there in the world? And it was like 5 billion. So I just did the math, just 0.2%. And I thought, oh my gosh, we're the one true church on the face of the earth. And God made it that way, you know. And we're all his children, but only 0.2%, you know, are living his plan. Didn't feel quite right. Another crack. The, one of the biggest cracks of my, um, of my life happened uh, when I was on my mission in Guatemala. Interestingly enough, there are probably two or three uh, people here um, today who served in my mission. Uh, they're in the Oasis community who served uh, missions with me in Guatemala. But uh, that's me on the left as a, as a Mormon missionary. And um, this is a monthly report that our mission president used to issue uh, in our mission. And I don't expect you to read it. Uh, you guys, many of you probably can't uh, speak Spanish anyway, but this is a monthly newsletter. It's February 14th, 1989. And what you'll notice here, misioneros que lograron la meta del Señor, mission, missionaries that, that uh, achieved uh, the Lord's goal, okay? And what you see there on the right is the number of baptisms they had that month, okay? And so you'll see Elder Danes and Samayoa had 39 baptisms in a month. Now, how many days are there in a month? Right? So they're averaging over a baptism a day. And I was working really hard and would maybe have 10 or 11, you know. And so I started asking around about how they had so many baptisms. And what I found out is what they would do is that they would go to the local soccer field on the mission and they would play soccer with these young Guatemalan boys um, and get them all hot and sweaty. And then afterwards they'd say, hey, let's go back to the church and cool off. <laughs> So they'd take him back to the church where the baptismal font was full, and they would baptize five or ten children at a time. Never having learned any discussions, no parental permission, they'd never been to church, and that's how they were able to get 30 or 40 baptisms in a month. I've since spoken with one of the missionaries who participated in this, and he told me that literally one of the children did a cannonball in the baptismal font. <laughs> True story. By the way, I couldn't find a Guatemalan kid um, doing a cannonball, because uh, there aren't many pools in Guatemala. So anyway, um, so I, I was scared. I was like, this seems evil, and there's no way my church would approve this. And so I, I'm, I'm scared, I don't want to cause trouble, but I, I, I can't just sit there. I remember that song about having courage, dare to do right. So I went and told my mission president, I said, this doesn't feel right, this is wrong, President Romney. And um, instead of like getting angry, and, and it turns out he yelled at me for um, speaking against the leaders of the church, uh, you know, not, not supporting and obeying the leadership in the mission, and he ended up exiling me uh, to an area, this Guatemalan town, that was five hour uh, bus ride to the nearest telephone. 11 hour bus ride to the mission home. And it was a really, really sad time for me because I was so idealistic. Uh, so much believed um, in, in what I was doing, and I felt like um, the church that I loved was, was not behaving as it should. So I came home from my mission with these cracks in my heart, but I was still very Mormon, still very committed. So I married my beautiful wife, Margie, in the, in the Washington, D.C. temple. We started living uh, our, our uh, traditional Mormon life. We had four children. These are my beautiful children here. Um, but then some more cracks started to emerge. Um, when I was working at Microsoft in Seattle, I started studying our church history more. And this is our prophet Joseph Smith. And while we had always taught that he was this amazing man with courage and strength, all these values that I had absorbed, we were taught that he was this amazing husband who had this beautiful wife, Emma, and they were really committed and devoted to each other. What I learned uh, while I was working at Microsoft was that actually Joseph Smith had 34 wives. And not only did he have 34 wives, but something like eight or nine of them, he took on as they were married to other men at the time, as his own wives. And that's troubling in and of itself, but what's more troubling is I could go 31 years in the church and no one had ever told me this. It had never been discussed in church, my parents had never talked to me about it, and I can tell you how sick I felt uh, when I learned the truth about this man. Um, and so more cracks started to develop. And probably the biggest crack that developed for me 
uh, was, um, it happened slowly, but while I was at Microsoft, I learned about this guy named Stuart Mattis, who was a returned missionary Mormon. One day, he, uh, he walks up to his local Mormon church building with a shotgun. He pins a, a letter to his chest that says, do not resuscitate. And he shot himself in the head at the steps of his church, his Mormon church. I'm like, why in the heck would somebody do that? Turns out he was gay. And that, that was troubling to me, but it didn't really, really change me until we learned about Scott. Scott is my wife's favorite cousin. They're close, uh, they've been friends since childhood. Um, the dearest individual, sweet, artistic, kind, gentle, loving, and while we were out in, in Seattle and Microsoft, we found out that, that Scott himself uh, had come out as gay. He came out to us before he came out to his own parents. And what was most troubling about this is this sweet, beautiful, incredible man told us that he had come close several times to killing himself uh, because, because he felt so ashamed and sad about it. And it was at that point where I said, this is unacceptable. I learned later that Utah had uh, the largest uh, rate of suicide of young men between the ages of 14 and 25. I realized that this was a national, this is a, a statewide epidemic, that one third of the homeless in Utah were LGBT youth that had been kicked out of their homes. And I remembered this song, right? Jesus walked away from none. He gave his love to everyone, so I will. And I said, we can't stay silent about this kind of stuff. And to make a really long story short, I started a podcast to talk about these issues called Mormon Stories. I was invited to give a TED talk about being an ally for LGBT individuals with Mormonism. Um, I, uh, I became an open supporter of women being ordained and in the church, uh, trying to follow the Mormon values that I had been taught. Um, again, you know, just like the song said, give, set the little stream, give, oh, give. I wanted to give to these people that I felt were mistreated and unappreciated. Well, to make it even longer, story short, in February of last year, 2015, I received a letter from my state president, uh, Dr. Brian King, who let me know that I would be summoned to a disciplinary council for my church and excommunicated for my work with Mormon Stories, for my advocacy for LGBT individuals, for my support of women ordination in the church, and for basically speaking openly about my doubts and concerns about the church. Um, so I was excommunicated. Um, I don't want to trivialize it. I, I can tell you, I can speak to you now in sort of a calm, collective way, but in reality, this was one of the most difficult things I've ever been through. Um, because that sweet Mormon boy that had had so many amazing experiences, uh, that looked upon his church with so much love and so much fondness, um, I was, I was uh, basically kicked out of my church, the church that I loved, the church that I was so proud of, for what I felt like was living the values that I'd been taught as a Mormon. But the good news is I still feel like I'm Mormon. I'm just sort of post-Mormon, kind of Mormon, <laughs> cultural Mormon. Uh, I still feel very Mormon. Uh, it's it's kind of like a secular Jew, I don't know. And to be honest, uh, I don't see Dr. King or you know President Romney or Joseph Smith as evil people. I really don't. Um, as I kind of think about what happened, um, they're living according to some ideas. That, that some people taught that they happen to believe. Um, and instead of targeting my anger at them or at the church, what's interesting to me now is the idea that ideas really matter. Um, ideas are what change the world. And so it just so happens that these men who are very gifted and talented in many ways happen to be taught a set of ideas that are suboptimal, that have some good traits, but also that can do a lot of harm. And so that's, um, you know, so I've kind of come to the conclusion, not that religion is evil. Religion can help you teach, can help teach you good values, but it can also teach you some really bad values. Religion can help teach you good values, but you don't need religion to be and to do good things. And so I've decided that I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going to retain a lot of the Mormon values that mean a lot to me. I'm going to try my best to remain honest. I'm going to try my best to be kind. I'm going to try my best to serve other people, to love people. And I believe in the type of community that I enjoyed as a Mormon. And that's the type of community that I see here in front of me today. 
Perhaps some of the values that I'm not so interested in holding on to are things like patriarchy and bigotry and exclusivity, and that God speaks to others, you know, but he won't speak to me. If God's out there, I'm listening. As soon as you show up, I'm paying attention. Until then, I'm gonna make use of every single moment I have because this may be the only life that I or that any of us get. And so now, I don't believe in death, I believe in life before death the life that's in front of me right now. And this doesn't make me wonder what's the purpose of life. What this makes me do is realize that every single moment is precious because I only have a few years left and that may be all that I get. And that's what I love about Oasis because if we're gonna talk about some ideas that are really transformative, this is not a bad set of values. The people are more important than beliefs. The reality is known through reason that meaning comes from making a difference, that human hands solve human problems, and that we should be accepting and be accepted. That sounds a lot like the Mormon values that I kind of grew up with, with a few of them left out. <laughs> it feels pretty good. So Mormons are known as pioneers. Uh, we're the ones who, with others, crossed the plains. We left things that were difficult. Um, we, we left behind the teachings of our forefathers. We, we left our comfortable cities and towns that we had settled. We crossed the plains, we endured hardship. We saw this vision of what could be, and we built this beautiful set of cities you know, along, along the Mountain West. And I'm proud of my pioneer heritage. And what I'd just like to end with today is to tell you that what I see here, what I see in front of you, what I see Helen doing, and Mike doing, and all of you here doing today, you seem to be picking up the pioneer values that I inherited as a Mormon. You seem to have courage and strength and determination to do something that's not easy, right? There are skeptics out there who don't believe in what you're doing, trying to form a secular community that can be built around love and service and kindness and acceptance and tolerance without the dogma, without the control, without the manipulation, without the bigotry. That's not easy. It's been tried in Utah and it's failed. Well, you're doing it, and Mike's doing it in Houston, and I hear it's being done in Boston, San Antonio, and there are a lot of us paying attention all across the United States to what you guys are doing right here in Kansas City. And I'm telling you, I'm inspired by that. You guys are showing the courage and the strength and the determination to leave something behind, to dream about a better way, to explore new territory, and to build something beautiful. And I'm telling you, what I see right here, what I see right before me, this is beautiful. And this is something worth emulating. So I'm still that optimistic, hopeful Mormon boy with the, with the values of love and kindness and service and charity. And all I can say is I'm inspired and I want to be a part of what you're doing. And there's a bunch of us in Utah who are going to try um, to team with you to make this Oasis dream a reality. So thank you very much for your time. encourage you to get married super young. Uh, my mom was probably 18 or 19 when she got married. They encourage you to have kids immediately. They had four kids within a you know, relatively short span of time. Uh, they didn't learn what intimacy was. In some ways, they were more married to the church than to each other. And by the time I was a young kid, uh, they just fell apart. And so it wasn't a conscious decision that was rationalized. It was just a series of unfortunate events that left them no choice. Um, so it was tragic, but 
Ironically, as much as Mormons emphasize family, our divorce rates are um, identical to the broader divorce rates in the United States. And uh, so, just we're just like everybody else. We get divorced, you know. Yes. Thanks, John, for uh, your great talk. Um, one of the things that I've noticed coming out of Mormons myself is that uh, we're seem very insular. Uh, our, the ex-Mormon community is not integrated well with uh, other secular communities. How do we go about, as individuals or groups, in integrating ex-Mormons into secular communities? So how do ex-Mormons sort of become more integrated with broader culture and society? And how do we help them to become integrated? How do we help them to become? Yeah, I don't know that, I don't know that ex-Mormons are wanting someone to help them. I think that, I think that it's a very traumatic thing to, uh, to be raised in a really fundamentalist religion and then to feel that sense of betrayal, uh, that sense of disappointment, that sense of regret, like, oh my gosh, I'm 30 or 40, I would have studied something different, I would have married someone different, I would have made a whole bunch of life choices. A lot of post-Mormons are just healing from trauma or disappointment or sadness or guilt. And many of them, the last thing they want is to join another group uh, where they can be disappointed again. Many of them need years of processing and almost deprogramming from the things that they had been taught. Um, establishing their own set of values because their values were always the church's values and it's really disorienting to figure out I've never drank before, I've never had premarital sex before, like I, and all of a sudden you can do anything you want because you don't have the church's values on top of you. So, uh, um, it's, 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 you know, what I like to say is um, there's going to be this processing that happens in post-religious communities where people struggle and argue and get angry and vent and process and support each other. And all that can happen is we can build a big, beautiful alternative. And it can just be there doing and being good things. I'm inspired by the service projects that I hear you guys do here in Kansas City and, and, and down in Houston. Um, and that's just a big light that gets put up on a hill for everybody to see. And there's a lot of ex-Mormons that are just never gonna wanna join anything again that even smells like a religion. Um, at the same time, uh, if, if we do good things together, build beautiful communities that do important service things, there are gonna be those who say, I'm ready to move on and, and stop looking behind me and start looking forward and to join a community that I can trust again. And uh, I love the transparency that you guys have, the financial transparency. I love the, the ways that you're um, you know, not a dict dictatorship, that you, you rule things by governance, by, by a board. Um, and there's so many values of the way that Oasis is run that I think it's gonna be attractive to people who are open to community. And so that's my answer. Let's build something big, bright, and beautiful. And those who wanna join us can and will. I was curious, did you have any issues with any of the supernatural teachings of the church or were your problems strictly with social issues? Supernatural? Like spiritual concerns? Any of the specific supernatural teachings? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, I remember, we're, we're taught as Mormons that we have this Book of Mormon, and if we pray, if we, if we read the book from cover to cover and pray, that, that the Holy Ghost, that God will manifest the truth of the book unto us. Um, and so I, I remember as a 16-year-old boy reading that book cover to cover. It's not a fun read, by the way. Um, <laughs> It's got a lot, some troubling stuff in it, but it's got some inspiring stuff in it, but I didn't care. Like, I'm just going to read the book, get to the end, make that prayer, and get a witness that the church was true. So I did that. I knelt on my knees. I read the Book of Mormon, 16 years old, knelt on my bed, said that prayer, and waited for an answer from God. And it didn't come. Uh, so I prayed again, and it didn't come. And I just said, oh my gosh, what, what's, is there something, you know, and, and what we often do in religion is instead of like, thinking, oh, maybe there's not a God, right? We turn back to ourselves and we say, what's, what's wrong with me? Maybe I wasn't worthy. What did I do wrong? And, and that set me for several years in this feeling like, I mean, I had never even, you know, a lot of st stuff. I felt like I was living pretty righteously. So I was confused by uh, feeling unworthy, but at the same time living uh, what I thought was a pretty high standard of living. So um, that was a crack. And uh, 
Yeah, and, and there are a lot of theological problems. Uh, the, the, just the issue of how blacks in the church were denied being members in full fellowship until 1978. Like, even as a kid growing up in Texas, that didn't feel right to me at the time. Um, and so the exclusivity bothered me, uh, the polygamy bothered me, but, um, but still, uh, the cultural pull is so strong. I mean, your, your ancestors, your parents, your siblings, your community, uh, it's all tied in there. So that gravity of community and family is so strong uh, that that can keep you in for, for many, many years, and it's good. But yeah, I have historical problems. Uh, now, the history had been hidden for me for so many decades that it wasn't until I was in my 30s where I really learned the history. So that became a problem for me later. But yeah, I had theological concerns, doctrinal concerns, spiritual concerns, um, and eventually historical concerns, and then social justice concerns. But, it, but that shows how powerful the effects of religion are. In spite of carrying all those concerns with me, uh, I didn't really contemplate ever leaving the church until my mid-30s. And even then, it took me another 10 years to leave, and I sort of had to make them kick me out because I wasn't going to leave on my own. I was basically going to just be as vocal as I could about the problems until they either decided that they were going to deal with the problems or kick me out. And that's how they chose to roll. So. So you uh, started Mormon Stories podcast as a Mormon, and now you're not non-theist. Is that what I understand for the most part? Uh, yeah. Um, and, and what my question though is that is there a great, clear, and strong evolution the way you're thinking of those? Was it ten years of the podcast? Can you see that in your ideas changing uh, as the podcast goes? Yeah. Yeah. I, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, as far as my own beliefs go now, I just, I, I, like I said in the talk, I, I believe in this life right now. And I, I personally think that, I don't love the terms agnostic or atheist, not because I have a problem with them. I just, this is going to sound cliche, but I don't like defining myself by some other construct that someone else hands to me. I don't like the limitations of those labels. Uh, I just don't think anyone can know whether there's a heaven or whether there's a God or anything. And, like I said, if God wants to come talk to me, I'm all ears. But until he does, I'm going to focus on this life. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Because I thought I knew a lot about the history when I started the podcast. But I started interviewing historians. And I got sicker and sicker to my stomach over the years as I learned more and more and more about our history. Uh, you know, so like Joseph Smith, I, I knew that he was polygamous. Later I learned that he married other people's wives, which was really disturbing. Later I learned um, that uh, if a woman declined his polygamous advances and then spoke openly about it, he would call her a whore in the local newspaper. Um, and that stuff over time just really eats away at you. But I had read this author called Kaim Potok who talked about Judaism and how it evolved over time into Reform Judaism where you don't even have to believe in God or that Moses, the founder of their religion, existed and you can still be a Jew. You just are a cultural Jew. And so for many years, as Mormon stories progressed, I had this belief that we could turn a branch of Mormonism into progressive Mormonism, where people could throw away the bad beliefs but still remain culturally and socially affiliated. Um, so a lot of my time in Mormon stories was trying to transform uh, the church inside and make space for a more progressive, non-literal version of Mormonism, but they, they aren't having any of that. <laughs> <laughs> Two more questions. At, at what point did you, in your discovery, as you found, did you arrive at a point where you had discovered so much, this layer upon layer of lie after lie after lie, uh, in terms of church history and with Mormon and all that, that you had this moment where you said, this is deception, worse than deception, it is fraud, all of these people are paying tithing, you know, the people at the local level are wonderful people, but anyway, the, the moment in which it really, it really stung when you realized this is deception and fraud. Yeah. So, um, for me, I started realizing that the church wasn't true back in like 2000, 2001, 2002, something like that. And that was a really hard step to sort of be willing to ask the question, is it possible it's not true? 
But I was, I was still committed to being a devout, progressive, liberal Mormon. What changed for me, I started the podcast in 2005, and immediately this flood, it was just like this huge water balloon in the sky, and someone had poked a big hole in it, and all this water started crashing down of pain and suffering and anguish. Because all these people, all these Mormons were suffering either quietly at church or having left the church ostracized by their parents, their spouses, their siblings, um, because of their unwillingness to go along. But no one had a place to go to talk about it. And so what they do is they would email me or call me or drive from like Wyoming to Utah or fly from Brooklyn to Logan, Utah and say, can I just spend two hours with you? Can I just tell you my story? And people would start telling me, I'm secretly gay, but my wife doesn't know. I'm bulimic. I have a sexual addiction. I'm chronically depressed. I'm suicidal. My son killed himself. I found my son, my gay son, my beautiful gay son, walked into the garage and I found my son hanging there from the rafters. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, and I had no idea that there was so much pain and suffering going on. So then I, I decided I was gonna become a psychologist to help these people. So I enroll in a psychology program and I start treating Mormons uh, at, at the University of Utah State University. And I'm finding all these gay kids who are suicidal, all these gay kids who married women because the church told them if they married them, their gayness would go away. And it didn't go away. And I'm finding all these women who are depressed and and all these missionaries that are literally cutting themselves because they masturbate and they can't stop, right? And I'm like, it's not like that's all Mormonism is. There's, like me, there's plenty of people who grow up in Mormonism and have this fantastic, beautiful, joyous experience. But what's unacceptable is the collateral damage of all the minority groups who uh, fall outside the church's sort of template for what's acceptable. And at some point, I got exposed to so much pain that I said, there's no way that I can remain complicit and silent in this effort that has beauty, but is damaging people of color, women, sexual minorities, etc. And it was, I sort of, you know, then Proposition 8 happened, and the church started campaigning openly against same-sex marriage, and I'm just like, fight is on, you know, and so I just became activated, and that, that's what changed it for me. Yeah, thank you. How's your own family changed? your wife and children come on this journey with you or did they develop kind of at the same speed you did? Just yeah. kind of how did it change your, your personal family? I am like the luckiest man in the world because um, you know as you guys have probably heard with you know other groups like Scientology um, Mormonism is the type of religion where if a husband decides that he no longer believes it is not uncommon for the wife to simply leave him and take the children. For parents uh, to completely disown or or remain forever disappointed uh, in their child for leaving the church. I, I often like to say that if you're an ex-Mormon and you cure cancer, you're still going to be a disappointment to your parents if you, if you leave the church. And that's true. Um, and so part of what, you know, along with the LGBT stuff, the women stuff, the people of color stuff, uh, the, 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 the way that ex-Mormons and post-Mormons are treated is completely unacceptable and uh, outrageous. And so I am the luckiest man in the world that my wife was willing to read and consider the stuff that I um, read. She loved her cousin Scott and she saw how the gays were treated in the church. And so she came along with me for the ride. She's been incredibly supportive of Mormon stories and all my work trying to reach out to the world. It hasn't been easy. It's, it took a toll in our marriage as I was saving everyone but ignoring my own family. So we've had to make adjustments so that I'm not neglectful um, of what's most important, which is my, my wife and kids. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, once I was excommunicated, my wife resigned from the church the day after I was excommunicated. Um, we wanted our, you know, I'm proud of my wife because she said, we're not gonna make our journey our kids' journey. And we're not gonna become sort of an alternative to the church sort of a negative image of the church to our children by telling them you have to leave the church now. And so we just let our kids have their own journey. And um, over time, they all decided that the church wasn't for them. Um, my, my oldest daughter uh, resigned from the church uh, just, just a few months ago because she, she wasn't comfortable. She's an LGBT ally. She went through ally training at the university and she wasn't comfortable having the church with her name on the rolls given the values that the church represents. So we're all out of the church. Um, 
but we're super happy. Uh, our marriage is stronger than ever. My kids are healthier and happier than ever. I'm not saying that like life is always better when you leave religion. It can get worse, um, and there are a lot of happy religious people. But for us, it's been an incredibly amazing uh, experience. We have better friends than we've ever had. We feel more authentic than we've ever felt, and our family's closer than it's ever been. So I, uh, I, I just say the future's super bright. So we're happy. Thank you for asking. But we're the lucky ones. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, John. That's all we have time for. He'll be standing up. So if you had a question that you had an opportunity to ask, you will hopefully have a chance um, afterwards or um, at lunch. Um, so it was funny, you said uh, you were hoping to be the Mormon that helped change all mankind. And after spending so much time with you in Utah, and then even yesterday, he held a religious transitions workshop here in Kansas City. I can assure you, you are a Mormon that helped change all mankind. Hands down, absolutely. Absolutely.